that's that's good. Um, which side? How many or which one? Did you guys do um, Holy Spirit? Yeah, we did. Holy Spirit. Um, okay. Hearts of Love. You got that one. Holy Spirit. No, I didn't. I, I didn't get to it. I ran Not out of time one. yesterday. Let's let's Not try. That one. Okay. Your 
glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your present love. day that the Lord has made. Okay, I need a little bit more on that, okay? Uh, just put a little more heart into that, please. This is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. Welcome to worship. It's great to see you here this fifth Sunday of Lent. Hey, you know what? It's St. Patrick's Day. It is St. Patrick's Day and, uh, yeah, March the 17th. Um, how many of you uh, are at least part Irish? That's right. This is Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, other parts of the country, it's higher. I happen to be one-quarter Irish. You might find that hard to believe, but it is true. I'm 25% Irish. Uh, I'm wearing green somewhere, but I can't tell you where. So um, let's leave it at that. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I hope you enjoy corned beef and cabbage at some point today or this week. And uh, along those happy lines, this is uh, a Sunday where we uh, also uh, have some very important announcements to make. So this is going to take a little time, a little longer than normal. Uh, first of all, uh, please find the friendship pad near you. Beautify that with your name. Pass it on down. And um, that would be a blessing to us. That's one of the ways we facilitate friendship and fellowship in our church. Um, our brother in Christ, Rick Amundrude, passed away this last Thursday afternoon after a lengthy illness. Please keep uh, his wife, Gloria, and the entire family in your prayers as uh, uh, they grieve uh, his loss. He is, as we say, uh, translated, graduated, from the church militant to the church triumphant, and so we rejoice in um, the final victory that Rick now enjoys. There will be a funeral service for Rick here on Friday morning at 11 a.m., followed by a luncheon. Um, Bibles and Brew, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. at the Ward House Brewery. You're all invited to that. Um, this Wednesday, 6.30, we uh, hope to see all of you here for the final of our midweek Wednesday Lenten services. Those have been good services, and we conclude our series, Witnesses to Christ, uh, this Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. The parents group meets on Thursday night. We meet for pizza and fellowship and Bible-centered discussion starting at 6 p.m. in the basement. Uh, there are children's activities if you uh, desire to come. This year, in partnership with the Wasika Ministerial Association, we will be hosting the 2024 Easter Community Dinner here. That's on March the 31st. If you would like to join us, there is a sign-up sheet in the back. We need to know how many people are coming for dinner. Uh, or if you would like to have food delivered to you, or if you'd like to pick it up yourselves here, uh, please sign that sheet. If you know of somebody, especially someone who lives alone, well, Easter is not a day to be alone, and um, uh, you can tell, uh, tell them about uh, our Easter dinner, and uh, they can contact us, give us a call, and uh, we'll put them on the list. So um, also, in conjunction with the Easter dinner, we are in need of a few more volunteers. We need drivers, we need people who will uh, serve for those picking up their meals, and uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the narthex for that. Um, that would be a blessing to us. There's also, if, if you notice in your bulletins, envelopes for the purpose of donating to the Easter dinner. And um, even though uh, a good chunk of what we will be doing is, is paid through the ministerial association, we still have some cost and some needs there, and you can certainly donate to that. Well, here's the, the big, long announcement, but very important announcement that we need to make. Um, yesterday, we had our annual council retreat, and it was a very, very productive time. We're excited to begin our process with our professional consultants, Ron Youngdale and Joel Corshin. 
And our goal is that by this summer, by the end of June, in fact, uh, we will know much, much better who we are as a church, and we will have one to three major goals in place, and that is by the end of June. Uh, by fall or at some point during the fall, we, uh, our, our plan is to have a strategic plan in place where we don't just set goals and say, this is what we want to do, but we have actual strategies for how to reach that one to three goals, and uh, that will be coming up in the fall. Uh, now, uh, in order to help this process, um, I need you to do a couple of things. First of all, um, we will send out, uh, if we happen to have your email address, we will send out a link to you where you will conduct a 20-minute survey called Know Your Church. That would be very helpful to us. And so if you happen to be high school age or older, we want your input on that. It takes about 20 minutes or so, and there's instructions as to how to get that survey um, to the diagnostic firm that we are using. Um, we will email you that link. Uh, if you happen not to be comfortable using that method, um, our wonderful council president, Barb Ressler, will be here next week with electronic devices, and she will personally help you uh, to navigate through that particular survey. Uh, if that is uh, uncomfortable for you and you need a hard copy, you, you, you need some paper in front of you, we can have copies of that available as well. Uh, you can fill out the paper and then we'll uh, have one of our folks uh, uh, fill, uh, input that in electronically. So um, uh, a number of different ways to do that. Now, here's what I need you to do. I need you to put two dates on your calendar because these are very important. The first one is Thursday evening, April the 11th, and that will be 6.30 p.m. Thursday, April 11th, 6.30. We will have a uh, congregational uh, meeting to discuss with our consultants. They will be here in person. Uh, they'll be presenting the report called Know Your Community. Um, and then on Saturday morning, April the 13th, our consultants will present the results of the Know Your Church survey to our leaders and to um, the members of the congregation who are there. And that meeting, by the way, might include also a discussion about our future property plans, the, the property that we own on the west side of town and our ministry needs. So as you can see, those are important meetings coming up. Once again, Thursday, April 11th, 6.30, Saturday, April the 13th, 9.30 in the morning. And with that, these are the announcements. So please rise as you are able. The peace of the Lord be with you. Please take a few moments to share a sign of that peace with each other. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Claire. And also with you. Peace be with you, gotcha. Remain standing for the first song and the invocation and the start of worship proper. Redeemer's praise, the glory. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Scripture is very clear that if we say that we are without sin, we're just deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's please take a few moments at this time to bring our silent prayers of confession before the throne of God's grace. Let's pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God has had mercy on us, and for the sake of his Son, Jesus Christ, and by his blood, he forgives us all our sins. On this, your true confession, and in obedience to the Lord's command, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's sing.
song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people, that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading today comes from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. God declared that a new day was coming when he would make a new covenant with Israel and Judah, a covenant unlike the one made with the patriarchs of the faith and the slaves of Egypt. The first covenant was broken by a disobedient people who refused to obey God's law. This covenant will be written on the hearts of the people. Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, 
though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those da days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive them their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Our psalm is taken from 119, verses 9 to 16. I'll read the odd-numbered verses, and the congregation will reply with the, ten, with the even. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With, with my, my whole, whole heart, heart I, seek, I you. seek you. Let me, Let not, me not wander, wander from, from your commandments. commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed, Blessed are you, O Lord. Lord. Teach, Teach me your, your statutes. statutes. With my lips, I declare all the just decrees of your mouth. In, in the, the ways way of, of your, your testimonies, I delight, I delight as, as much in as in all riches. riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight, delight in, in your statutes. statutes. I, will I will not forget, forget your, your word. word. Our epistle reading today is from Hebrews 5, verses 1 to 10. Those who were appointed as high priests in Israel still had to make sin offerings for their own sins, as well as for the sins of others in the community. Jesus, who was perfect, was designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, both king and priest. His offering was made through prayers and supplication while on earth. His final sacrifice of his life granted us eternal life. Hebrews 5, verse 1. Every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. Taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, 
but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated, and seated, and I'm going to call the children to come forward for the children's sermon. So, kids, come on up. Come on down. Okay, hi. How you guys doing? So I, I got something kind of fun here today. Um, you know, I, I built this last night, and uh, can you tell me what that is? It is a pyramid, yes. Right answer. Ding, ding, ding. You are correct, Margaret. This is a pyramid. And uh, you might wonder, why was Pastor Eric spending time on a valuable Saturday night building pyramids with Legos? Well, I'm going to tell you that, okay? So um, I want you to take this pyramid, and, you know, the, the Egyptians would build these, and, uh, you know, it looks something like that. Um, I want you to uh, use your imagination and imagine that this pyramid has a whole bunch of people on it, okay? And they're going up level by level, and they get higher and higher and higher and higher, and then you finally get to the top, and there's only one person at the top because there's only room for one up there. And all the people down here, they are uh, kind of, um, you know, rustling with each other and uh, trying to get past each other because they're all trying to get to the top because the guy at the top gets to give all the orders, and he gets to have all of the other people below him serve him. And so, using your imagination, you can think, gosh, it's, uh, I, I see why people are trying to get to the very top, because that's the best position. That's where you get to order everyone else around, and they serve you. And um, so, um, thank you for using your imagination on that. And now, um, this is uh, really a picture of what the world is like. The Bible tells us that this is kind of how the world functions. Jesus told his disciples, this is how the world is. You know, everyone trying to get to the top, and the person or people at the top uh, have everyone else serve them. And so here's what Jesus does. Jesus takes this pyramid, and he just simply goes like this. And he says, this is how it is in the world. This is how I want you to be. So if you want to be someone great, you want to be someone important, then you have to become the servant of all. If you want to be someone in my kingdom, then you become a servant, and you become the servant of all. So here's the world. This is God's kingdom. Here's how maybe we want to be this is how Jesus wants us to be. And that's what he's teaching us in the gospel passage today. And it's really hard to get this because we can't do that apart from the power of the Holy Spirit because by nature, this is how we are. We're always trying to climb to that top spot. By the Holy Spirit, this is what we begin to look like because you know what? This is exactly what Jesus looks like. Jesus came into this world even though he was in the form of God, but he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself and he took on the form of a servant and he became the servant of all, even, even to the point of death. And so if we want to be followers of Jesus, this is how we're going to be living. And um, I hope that uh, that lesson sticks with you today. 
And I'm going to ask you to stand and uh, pray with me, okay? So stand. Let's uh, bow our heads, close our eyes, put our hands together. I'm going to pray for you, and you guys are going to pray for this whole congregation. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our God, we thank you that you tell us that your kingdom is like exactly the opposite of the rest of the world and that you want us to live as servants just as you were a servant. Help us to do that, Lord, because by nature we want to scratch and claw our way to the top. But help us to do it. Um, Lord, imprint this lesson upon our children here today and imprint it on us as well, Lord, because we have difficulty with it too. And by doing that, Lord, help us to walk more like you and to reflect you in the world around us for the sake of your gospel and for your kingdom. We pray it, Lord Jesus, in your name. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Okay. Well, thank you for helping me with that, guys. Here you go. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to serve you. And uh, once again, the Lord be with you. So, um... I had an interesting uh, Sunday morning, it was a beautiful Sunday morning actually, a number of years ago, I think it was um, 2017 if I'm not mistaken, a fine Sunday morning, and um, the Lord arranged a little test for me, a little test. Uh, I was going about my uh, duties which involved preaching and a few other things, you know, kind of a normal Sunday, and uh, we had two services at that church. And uh, I didn't have to teach Sunday school that morning, so I thought, oh, okay, kind of an easy morning. Uh, I was beginning to think after the first service, yeah, I can go out. I can uh, make my way out to um, uh, the Starbucks that was very close by the church, grab myself a cup of coffee, have kind of a nice leisurely morning, ease my way into the 11 o'clock service, and a pretty good morning. Didn't work out that way, because about 945 When most people had cleared out of the building or they had uh, found their way into their Sunday school classes, um, a church member came up to me and she was absolutely frantic and there was this look of desperation on her face. And she said this to me. She said, Pastor, there's a toilet overflowing in the men's bathroom and there's water going all over the floor in the hallway and it's just about reaching the kitchen now. Do you think somebody should do something about that? And I said, "Um, well, yeah. And uh, naturally, what she was saying was, Pastor, maybe you should be doing something about that. Yeah, that's usually what they mean. And so naturally, my first response, being the spiritual leader of the church, was to pray. So I said a quick prayer, which went something like this. Lord, here am I. Send a custodian. Uh, Now, there's a problem with that because I looked around and our head custodian was nowhere to be found. In fact, we had three custodians at that church, and I could not find a single one of them. And then I began to do some theological reflection. And you know, in situations like this, um, we always do interesting theological reflection. Uh, We tend to go to the abstract Uh, to subtle theological points and profound theological insights of the deepest kind. And my theological thoughts at this moment were, why the heck should I get stuck with this? I'm the senior pastor of the church. My goodness, we have a staff of over 30 people here. Why do I get stuck with the bathroom problem? Well, I got an answer to my theologically abstract and subtle, fine-pointed rumination on the situation, but I'll tell you about that later. We'll we'll, we'll get back to that. Most of us are brought up with the idea of upward mobility. You know what that is, upward mobility? You start maybe somewhere at the bottom, a menial job, and if you stick around for a while, you work your way up until eventually maybe you become the CEO of the company. You know, you uh, are diligent, you get good grades, you work hard, you move up. Most organizational charts look something 
like this pyramid, don't they? I mean, we're all kind of familiar with this. Heck, we even have an organizational chart at our church that, you know, roughly resembles that. Most of them look like this, and the person at the top supposedly is the one with all the power. Now, traditionally, that's how American corporations ran until about uh, the early 1950s when guys like Drucker came along and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this concept that the guy at the top is the one who gets served. And Drucker and others actually started thinking in terms of this. Am I right about that, John? You, know, you probably have studied some of this stuff. Yeah. And that uh, started happening at some point in the 1950s. But before that, everyone assumed this is the guy that has everyone else serving his needs. Well, anyway, the disciples of Jesus. So they bought into this idea of the organizational pyramid. It's obvious from our passage this morning. And, um, you know, just uh, for starters, can you believe what these guys say? Jesus has just predicted his death. He has predicted horrible things were going to happen to him in Jerusalem, and then he would rise again on the third day. And it's like these guys don't even hear it. It's like just breezed right past their heads. And so James and John come up with a brilliant line. I mean, this is truly brilliant. And uh, it goes like this. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Can you imagine yourself asking Jesus a question like that? Jesus, I'd, I'd like you to do whatever you, I, I ask of you. That's what these guys are doing. Um, you know, I use that line as a joke in our household. You know, I'll say to Bev, now, honey, I want you to do for me whatever I ask of you. Nowadays, she won't even let me get it out of my mouth because she knows what's coming. You know, in the old days, I used to say, hey, it's in the Bible. It's Scripture. Uh, she doesn't buy that either. Uh, you know, and it's kind of a joke that we have in, in our house. But the disciples' attitude is no joke. It's a symptom of their fallenness. They want to be in a position where they're going to be the ones who are served. And truth be told, most of the time, we are in that position as well. We would rather be served than to serve. Um, and of course, you probably picked up that James and John have absolutely no idea what they are asking because they weren't hearing what Jesus was saying about his suffering. They stopped listening probably the moment that they heard that he was really the Messiah. And so in their minds, they're thinking, Jesus is going to be king. That means that he's on the top of this structure, which means that we can vie for the number two and three spots at his right and left side. And that would be a pretty darn good position in the coming kingdom of God that they were expecting. And they had no idea what he was saying. Um, and so... Um, Jesus says, well, what do you want me to do for you then? They say, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in glory. And Jesus' response is, you don't even know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup of which I'm about to drink? That means his suffering. Or be baptized with the baptism which I'm about to undergo? That's his death. And by the way, it also means that he's going to be taking on himself the sins of the world. Uh, once again, James and John's response to these questions of Jesus, their, their response is short and classic. Are, are you able to drink this cup and be baptized with this baptism? And their answer is, yup, sounds good to me. It's, it's about that thoughtful on their part. Jesus reminds James and John, well, you will suffer, but to sit at my right and at my left is for those for whom it has been prepared. It's, it's not my decision, Jesus is saying. So what is he talking about when he says that? Well, there's only one time in the scripture where it can be said that there's some kind of enthronement of Jesus. And on that particular occasion, the scriptures say that he was greeted with cries of, Hail, King of the Jews. 
He was robed in purple, the only time that he was on this particular occasion. He was given a scepter, he was given a royal procession, and he was crowned. He was crowned with a crown of thorns. And he was lifted up high for the world to see. And Pontius Pilate even arranged for a trilingual sign to hang on the cross which read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. So the crucifixion of Jesus is about the only enthronement of Jesus that we find in the New Testament. It was his coronation. It was his enthronement. And who are the ones at his right and left in that coronation? The two thieves. Those were the ones for whom it was chosen. At the cross is where Jesus ultimately takes the world's pyramid and the entire thing is just turned upside down like this. At the cross is where all those who have been upwardly mobile have to ask themselves the question, what, I, what have I been climbing all these years? Have I been climbing up or am I climbing down? At the cross is where those who lord it over others have to ask themselves the question of how they will be judged They'll have to ask themselves the question, am I moving towards greatness or am I moving towards ignominy and insignificance? When that pyramid turns upside down, our perceptions naturally change with it. In light of the cross, how does each of us measure up? If you want to know how you measure up, it might be good to ponder this passage uh, prior to the day of judgment. And here's the standard that Jesus gives us. Whoever would be first among you, at the top, whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. Of course, there is only one person who will be in that position, and that's Christ himself. Now, at this point, I could preach a brilliant sermon about commitment, about really understanding, counting the cost, counting the sacrifice of following Jesus. I could preach a lot about servanthood, um, and I could get kind of loud and exercised about that. I suppose I could. Um, Preachers are pretty good at guilting people into doing stuff. I'm not going to do any of that today. We're going to go a different direction. The surprising fact about taking the role of a servant is that it's really not that heroic. It's not even that difficult. In fact, uh, some of you are on that road already in significant ways. And how is that? It happens through our daily callings, the daily vocations that God has already called us to. And I'll give you some examples. Parents, Dads with strollers, moms with strollers as well. If, if you're having children and raising your kids in the Christian faith, then you are missionaries and evangelists, and you are servants to your children. You're truly doing the work of God's kingdom. Um, some of you are not parents. Some of you may be uh, assisting uh, another family member in, in their life journey. You might have family members who are elderly or feeble of mind or they're, they're sick. And in your serving, what is happening? You're taking that chart and you're turning it upside down. That's what's happening when you serve your family member. And so whenever you uh, wash their dishes, Whenever you uh, clean up a relative's messy bowel movements, you're serving the Lord. And you're turning that pyramid of the world right side up. Uh, Children, we got a couple of them here. We got some youth here. When you obey your parents and your teachers, or when you're kind to your friends, or if you pray for someone's salvation, you're serving the Lord. You're being a servant, and you're taking that pyramid, and you're turning it upside down or maybe I should say right side up. If you're an employee, we've got some here. If you're a worker, an employee, 
You know, some of you go to work every day, not to get ahead, but just to help your family make ends meet. And I don't know, maybe some of you don't even like your jobs that much, but you go and you faithfully serve there every single day. You serve there perhaps even with the hope that what you're doing might have a good effect on someone else. You're being a servant. You're helping carry the cross. And you're turning the world right side up. You're saying that doesn't sound heroic, and you're absolutely right. But this is how God expresses himself. This is how God mystically shows up in this world of ours that is fallen and upside down. And you know what? Martin Luther would say, that's the way that you carry your cross. And you're taking that pyramid and turning it right side up. Um, many of you do volunteer in the church. And uh, we praise God for that. Uh, those of you who serve diligently right here in God's house, you ever get tired sometimes of doing it? I'm sure that you do. You ever get tired of the fact that there just never seems to be enough people volunteering? Of course you do. But whenever you are asked to serve, you're the ones who say yes. And when you say yes, that's the life of Christ in you. That's God making a holy vocation, a holy calling upon your life. And in that you say yes, you're taking the pyramid and turning it right side up. Now there's a wonderful movie out right now uh, called Cabrini. If you don't know anything about her, Mother Cabrini was an outstanding servant of God. She was a nun who came to this country from Italy, didn't know any English, but uh, God had given her a task to do, and that was to start orphanages. And so with literally nothing in her pocket, she started the work of working in orphanages and collecting orphans from the street. And she opened up orphanages, hospitals, and schools eventually across the country and eventually across the whole world. Mother Cabrini was the living embodiment of speaking truth to power in the name of Jesus. And in the Catholic Church, um, she was um, canonized as a saint, the first saint from America to be canonized for her service. She's the patron saint of immigrants, and by the way, uh, in case you're interested at all, Colorado just declared a state holiday in her honor. There's now on the calendars in Colorado a Mother Cabrini Day, if you can believe that, because she started orphanages there as well. But here's the point of all of this. You don't have to be a Mother Cabrini or Martin Luther to turn the world right side up. You just have to be a servant. And there are those in the Christian church who would suggest you're not really serving the Lord unless you're going overseas on a mission or you're doing something heroic, you know, working in the soup kitchens or sleeping with a homeless on the street at night or agitating for social justice. Well, I got to tell you that that just is not true. That is not true at all. And please don't get me wrong. If that happens to be a calling on your life, then by all means, Go ahead and do it because the Lord wants you to do it. But I would never suggest that you have to do that in order to truly be a servant. Like we've already said, sacrificial service can be done even in your own household. It can be done in this city of Waseca. It can be done in this church. It can be done in your own living room. God has so arranged things that life creates those opportunities. And just in case you need it, a lesson in servanthood or humility, I'll pray that God arranges something for you just like um, a men's room toilet overflowing. You know, that might, something might just happen to you uh, to drive home that lesson of servanthood. And so with that, now you're probably wondering as to how my fine-feathered theological question God answered, why in the heck should I be stuck with this? I'm the senior pastor. And I'll tell you, the answer came back to me something like this. Who are you to think that you're above this, that somehow or another this is beneath you? Who are you to think that? And so set the example, get out there and lead. And that's what I did. So 
I found a mop in a bucket, and I started mopping, and I cleaned the bathroom, and it was done just in time for the 11 o'clock service. That was probably the best sermon I preached that day, even though most people didn't see it. Philippians 3, 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, and you know the rest of it probably, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Now the point is this, the Son of Man came not to serve, but not to be served, but to serve, even to the point of being a slave to all and a ransom for all. If you're already taking the form of a servant on behalf of somebody else, thank you. You're helping to turn this world right side up. Everyone who would follow Jesus, everyone, must become a servant to others. Somewhere, some way, and soon. If you haven't done so already, grab a mop in a bucket, and serve. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our God, thank you that we see in you the ideal servant, the one who humbled himself to the lowest point of all, death upon a cross, that we might be served and that we might be the beneficiaries of the ransom that you paid so dearly for. Help us, Lord, to follow your example and to serve you and to serve gladly that this world might be turned right side up. Amen. And now please uh, rise as you're able and together let us proclaim the faith that was once and for all delivered unto the saints as embodied in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we continue to worship by the giving of our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Just one word about the wording of the Apostles' Creed. We've had some comments on the change in the words, and I need to uh, explain to you why that change was made. We changed the words because our confirmation students are learning it with the more traditional wording which we have here. And we felt that we could best reinforce their memorization by saying it the way that they're going to be uh, learning it. And so uh, we have reverted back to that older way of doing it in order to reinforce their learning. And might I say that uh, by doing that, we as a congregation are actually taking the role of being servants to them and edifying and helping them in the process of Christian formation in their lives. And so I want to thank you for that and thank you for allowing me this explanation as to the change. And with that, let us continue to worship by the giving of our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Teach me. 
Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit. Write your word on our hearts that we may know you as the God who forgives our iniquities and remembers our sins no more. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, your Son came not to be served, but to serve. Help us not to lord it over others, but humbly serve one another in our homes, communities, and congregation, as Christ has so humbly served us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, as your only begotten Son learned obedience through what he suffered, we pray that you would instruct, bless, and relieve your servants who are sick and recovering. We pray especially for these dear ones, Ray Peterson, Gloria Amundrud, Gregory Easton Jr., Bill Bridget, Clifford Headland, Art Thole, Leona Wenzel, Merle Williamson, Alice Barasa, June Holman, Eileen Wabner, Mike O'Neill, Ron Sieberson Sr., Phyllis Swenson, Leland Root, Ruth Hawker, Dale Loken, and all those we now name silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, as your Son proclaimed to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. So proclaim to the family of Rick Amundrud this truth. May Rick's passing be a sign and speak to Rick's entire family the peace of those whose death is precious in your sight. And communicate the truth of your blood-bought future for those who believe in you. By the power of your word and spirit, Lord, Speak to them and all who have recently lost loved ones. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the benediction, the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen? Amen. Okay. I thought I heard it there, but maybe uh, needed to reiterate it again. All right. Let's uh, close our service time together with singing God So Loved.
Okay.